Thank you for having me. I'm Allison Ebbinger. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a series of projects working on improving our understanding of and our ability to evaluate what exactly our NLP systems are capturing, what exactly our NLP systems are able to understand about language. And these projects are going to have in common that they draw on a variety of levels of what we know about human cognition in order to increase this, in order to better this understanding of what these NLP systems are capturing. So I'll be talking about three different projects that are interconnect, interconnected in these ways. So the big goal of natural language processing, at least from the perspective of many, is to achieve so-called natural language understanding. And we can define understanding in a variety of ways. It's really quite a difficult notion to pin down. But I think we can safely say that the ideal would be to achieve a human level capacity to extract, represent, and deploy information from language input. I'm going to be focusing on information in terms of the way that we define understanding, the way that we try to evaluate things. So when we define understanding in this way, the immediate question that arises is how do we evaluate understanding when defined in this way? How do we assess the information that a system has captured? An easy answer and a sort of a standard answer over the years has been downstream tasks. Can we just see how a system does on, on sentiment analysis, see how a system does on NLI, et cetera, and from this conclude, you know, if you've mastered NLI, if you've mastered sentiment analysis and a variety of other tasks, then you've probably mastered what we want to call natural language understanding. The problem with taking this approach gets at sort of a fundamental challenge that we're faced with at this time in NLP, which is that we have now these extremely powerful pre-trained, language model pre-trained uh, models like BERT and its successors, ELMO, which perform extremely well in the ex existing benchmarks that we have. And if we take this performance at, its, at face value, we might come to the conclusion that we have essentially solved, considering sometimes we have even superhuman performance, come to the conclusion that we've essentially solved NLP and solved natural language understanding. The problem with this conclusion is that no one who's really paying attention actually thinks that we have solved natural language understanding. If you probe, if, you, if you, you prod these models with more adversarial examples, look at them a little more closely, typically you find that it's not that difficult to break them. The robustness isn't quite there. There's something that's missing, missing with respect to the, the, that human capacity that we'd like to be able to emulate. So this is a fundamental mismatch that really needs to be addressed within the field to this point. If we have benchmarks that are telling us that our systems are doing essentially perfectly in many cases, but this isn't allowing us to assess what we actually would believe is understanding, then we need to, we need to try to close that gap. And this is going to be the dominant question underlying the, 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 the projects that I'll be talking about here, this question of how can we do a better job of understanding, a more effective job of evaluating what it is that our models are capturing, what it is that they actually know about language, and how well they're doing something that we would reasonably consider to be understanding. We're going to be using human cognition as a lens for doing this. We're going to examine this problem from the perspective of multiple different levels of human cognition. And when I say something like this, you might very reasonably come, up, come forward with the objection, well, why are you putting so much of a focus on humans? We were able to build planes without flapping their wings, so why should we force our NLP systems to emulate humans? This is completely fair, and I am in complete ag agreement on the fact that we don't need to emulate, well, the jury is out, but we don't necessarily need to emulate human mechanisms for language understanding in order to achieve language understanding. That being said, what it means to have achieved language understanding is necessarily going to be defined based on humans and human cognition. Language is a uniquely human system, and whatever it is to have understood language, this is going to have to match whatever humans do with language. And this is not a revolutionary idea. This is not just coming from me. This idea is implicit in the fact that essentially all of our NLP benchmarks use some form of human judgment uh, as, as the way of doing the evaluation. Everyone in the field recognizes that if you want to have achieved language understanding, the outputs of your system need to be able to match the outputs of the human system. You don't necessarily need to get there in the same way, but you do. the problem really is defined based on humans. So it makes, from that perspective, a lot of sense to define the problems and to recognize what, how what we're doing at the output level matches human cognition. Because of the fact that we're looking at multiple different levels, it's important to keep in mind that it is not the case 
most likely, that we want to emulate all aspects of human cognition. And this also goes back to the fact that we don't necessarily want to emulate all the mechanisms. So there are certain levels of the human understanding system that do make sense for us to emulate with our NLP systems. In particular, the endpoint of comprehension. We want to capture the meaning, the output of the system, all of the information that the human system is able to capture at the endpoint of the comprehension process. We would like to be able to get, capture that. There are other aspects of the human processing system, errors, the earlier and inter intermediate stages of processing, that don't necessarily make sense for us to actively emulate, because why would we want to produce errors? Why would we want to do shallower processing if we don't necessarily have to? If it's a necessary function of our system, as perhaps it is of the human system, then, then perhaps, but it doesn't seem to make sense to actively court those types of errors. That being said, what we find and what I'm going to be showing in, in, later in this talk is that sometimes our models actually do resemble these other aspects that are not necessarily what would be our ultimate target. That is the endpoint of comprehension. So one of the points that I want to make here is that this is something that is worth identifying, thinking about why it is that that's happening given the way that our systems work, and trying to figure out what it is that needs to change in order for us more effectively to target that endpoint of comprehension, which is what we want the output of our systems actually to look like. There's going to be three parts to this talk. The first part is going to be focused on the problem of producing past general sentence representations. It's going to be assessing those sentence representations against this endpoint of human comprehension, that is the meaning. We're going to be using probing tasks for that. As, as Paul was mentioning, I worked previously with probing tasks. One of the things that points that we're going to be making in that part of the talk is that there are certain models, especially bag of words averaging models is what we're going to be focusing on in, in, in that component, that are fundamentally limited in their capacity to emulate the actual endpoint of human comprehension. But that actually, due to the way that those, those models are learned, the, the, the components of those models are learned, actually end up resembling predictive responses that we do observe within humans, that we don't necessarily want to emulate, but it might be worth understanding why our systems do sometimes resemble those. And then in the third part, I'm going to draw together those different parts to ask what at this point is becoming a very relevant question, which is, we have these new pre-trained models that are performing extremely well across tasks. What is it that these models are learning about language during the pre-training process that's allowing them to perform so well? Trying to better understand what's going on within those models. So to start with the first part, assessing systematic composition. We're going to be looking at past general sentence representations, and we're in particular going to be focused on composition. So the human capacity for language, thinking again about the out outputs of these systems and the, the ultimate capacities of the system, the human language Humans are able to understand infinite sentences, including nonsensical sentences like this one that presumably they've never encountered before. Presumably this doesn't exist in any corpus. It, it does at this point because of the example I used in the paper, but before that it presumably had not been, been used. The turquoise giraffe recited the sonnet but did not predict the flight attendant. This is a very strange and nonsensical example, but despite all of these facts, you're able to extract the meaning of this sentence without a problem. And the reason that you're able to do this is that language has human language has a, a property known as composition. You're able to take the different parts and use those to derive the meaning of the whole. So the question that we set out to answer with this first project was how is it, how, how well are we doing at this process of systematic composition, which is going to be critical for any system that's able, that, that's trying to do sentence representation learning. How are we doing at that um, with our current sentence encoders? And the challenge with answering this question is simply that our typical encoders produce dense vector representations, which are fairly opaque to interpretation, and we need to find some way of trying to assess what information is contained and extractable from, uh, contained in and extractable from these vectors. So for this, we turn to probing tasks, what, it, what has now been, uh, come to be known as probing tasks. For anyone not already familiar, this essentially amounts to identifying some type of information that you'd like to probe for within your representations identifying a classification task that will target this type of information, encoding your sentences as vector representations and using these as input to the classification <coughs> task, drawing conclusions based on the performance on that task about whether the relevant information for doing the classification task was encoded. We propose the use of these types of classification tasks for um, probing for semantic information back in 2015, around the same time that Adi et al. came out with a paper doing similar things with somewhat more uh, superficial sort of word content and word order tasks. 
But it's worth noting that this type of approach dates back over a decade within the field of neuroscience in the form of multivariate pattern analysis, which is similarly used to discern information encoded in recorded brain activity. So the distinguishing characteristic of our work with respect to other probing work is that we target aspects of sentence meaning specifically relevant to composition because we're specifically wondering to what extent these neural network systems are managing to capture this systematic composition. And as Tal was mentioning, is part of how we approach these probing tasks, we take additional measures to control these tests in order to increase our confidence and conclusions. And I'll give some detail about those here. The first control that we impose is we generate our sentences via a generation system that's able to take specific constraints as input and output a corpus of sentences that meet that constraint and vary along other unspecified dimensions. In this way, we're able to produce a large corpus of sentences for classification, which are controlled in the ways that we want and don't vary in ways that we don't understand. The second control, and this one is really quite critical for our purposes, is we make use of bag of words averaging models as a sanity check baseline. So a bag of words averaging model just takes the vector representations for the words of the sentence and averages them together, necessarily sacrificing any order information. So if you have sentences like these that have the same word content, but different meanings, this is a distinction that a bag of words model is not going to be able to capture. What this means is that it is logically impossible that a bag of words representation is going to be able to have retained whatever information there may be that requires access to word order. So for any task that would require access to word order, bag of words models should be at chance. We control our, we use this as a sanity check. We control our items to the point that bag of words models are at chance on anything that requires access to word order. Now it's worth noting the Adi et al paper, for instance, had a word order detection task and they found that their bag of words averaging model performed substantially above chance. Now if we think about this for just a second, it's not all that surprising that this could happen because it's very reasonable that the word embeddings themselves could have picked up on information about statistical regularities in order within the corpus on which those word embeddings were trained. But critically, we're not interested with these probing tasks in probing for the extent to which these sentences tell you things about general statistics. We want, we want to be able to, the sentence to be able to capture not only the waitress served the customer, but also the customer served the waitress. There are many different types of sentences. So to the extent that we want to be able to distinguish the extent to which the representation tells us about how sentences are in general versus how this particular sentence is that we're trying to encode, this is a good check, a good baseline to compare against. So this describes our general framework. The question next is what information should we probe for? And the question that we ask is what information do we know that humans extract systematically? And we choose two target information types to, to, as a starting point. And we choose these two because they are A, very fundamental to sentence meaning, and B, they're very uncontroversial across communities, NLP and cognitive science alike. And the first of these is semantic role, essentially information about who did what to whom within the sentence, and negation, which we can say roughly amounts to what happened and what did not. The way we formulate the classification task to probe for these different types of information so it follows for semantic role, we say given a sentence representation and a probe X and Y, is X the agent of Y? Did X, was X the doer of Y? C. So we have sentence like the waitress who served the customer is sleeping, probes of waitress and serve. In this case, waitress is the one who did the serving, so this would be a positively labeled example. The waitress who served the customer is sleeping, now probes of customer and sleep. In this case, the customer is not doing the sleeping, it's the waitress. This would be a negatively labeled example. This is what the semantic role classification task looks like. For negation, we formulate our task as follows, given a sentence and a probe Y, did Y happen? Waitress is serving the customer is not actually sleeping. Sleep is negated in this case, negative. Waitress is not actually serving the customer who is sleeping. Sleep as the probe in this case, uh, serve is negated, but sleep is not, so it should be a positive example. So these were our classification tasks. These were the ones that were trying to target compositional information. Our, our probing classifier is the simple NLP with a single hidden layer. The inputs are the sentence embedding and the representations for the probes. The sentence encoders that we tested include bag of words as our sanity check, as I said, um, and a number of sequence models. I, at the moment, am not planning to go into a ton of detail about these different sequence models. They have a variety of different 
uh, encoder decoder architecture is a variety of different objectives, but what we'll find is that they perform quite similarly to each other despite all these different architectures. So if you're interested in knowing the details, I'm happy to answer that um, later on. But we do have the consistent um, property that all of the embeddings have 2400 connections. We also, as a sanity check, employ a couple of surface tasks drawn from the audio at all paper, because these are tasks for which we have a bit more of an a priori expectation about what we expect to see. So these are word content, given probe x is x present in the sentence, and word order, given probes x and y, does x precede y in the sentence. So with respect to these, this is essentially to say, are, are probing tasks giving us patterns that look essentially like what we would want to? I'm gonna show you now the classification accuracies for all the different encoders. First, we're gonna do our bag of words sanity check task. We see that for the word content task, which is the one task that we would expect bag of words to be able to do, it's at 100% accuracy. This is roughly what we would expect for the other three tasks that do require access to word order, roughly at 50%, roughly a chance. So this tells us that we have essentially managed to control our data lexically speaking to the point that we wanted to. And that's what that bag of words sanity check tells us. Moving on to the, yeah. It's binary, yeah. It's it's given given probes x and y. Does x precede y in the sentence? Yeah. Um, so, for the sentence encoders on these sanity check tasks, we see that the sequ the sequence models, sorry, <laughs> the sequence model sentence encoders are uh, again roughly at ceiling on word content. Not quite at ceiling, but still very strong on word order. This again is roughly what we would expect because unlike bag of words, these models are able to retain information about word order. When we move on to our more semantically interesting task, we see the following. For negation, the sequence models are again, essentially at ceiling on this task with the exception of what's known as the bi-skip model. The difference with the bi-skip model is that this is a concatenation of representations from a forward and a backward pass of a sentence. So what we believe is going on here is that despite our best efforts, um, and despite the fact that we did go through the trouble of decoupling this task from one of detecting proximity between negation and the verb, we were not able to decouple this from a task of detecting which verb comes next after the negation, no matter how many words come between, other words come between. Um, and this is a heuristic that the forward sequence models would be able to use, but the backward would not, so that concatenation may be the reason that you're seeing lower performance there. For the semantic role task, however, which we were able, we don't have any reason to believe that this one is not controlled mostly to our liking, we see that the performance is only marginally above chance for all of the different sequence models, and for the in-percent model, which at the time was quite a competitive model, um, the, the accuracy is squarely at chance, suggesting that, that the, the representations that come out of that model encode no more systematic information about semantic role than the bag of words sanity check task. So again, just to recap, these columns on the right are the ones that are of most interest to us from a perspective of composition and semantics. And the basic takeaways that we had from this paper were sequence models appear to identify some kind of linking of negation to the next verb, which definitely is not a full solution to the problem of negation. And I'll be coming back to negation in a later part of this talk with different methodologies for, for testing it. Um, but it's a, it's a start, it's a non-trivial starting point for, for learning dependencies. And moving on to semantic roles though, which is our more successfully controlled task, it looks like we have work to be done in, in capturing that. Now, subsequently, we have all of the, all the Sesame Street models that have been coming out, et cetera. Question is, you know, do, is there a sort of generalizable sentence encoding that we can test? So we, we did run this Davis Yoshida TPIC tested semantic role. Um, just the semantic role task on Elmo Bert and GPT. He tried a number of different configurations, including Bert's CLS token as a sentence representation, averaging together all of the word piece tokens, et cetera, tried at various different layers and different weightings of different layers. What you're gonna see below is the best configuration for each model. Elmo came in at 68%. Bird at 63 and GPT at 61. So while Elmo was a little bit ahead of the pack in terms of what we were seeing with the previous encoders, the pattern looks pretty much the same. Still really only marginally above chance. It looks like we still have work to be done in terms of having a single sentence encoding that is able to capture this semantic role information systematically in the way we're looking for. All right, so that's part one. In part two, we're gonna be looking at these simpler models and ways in which they actually resemble not this endpoint that we were targeting in the first part, but maybe some other aspects of cognition sort of by accident. 
So, so again, in part one, I was emphasizing a lot that bag of words model really cannot be capturing sentence meaning, so it really can't, any model that resembles bag of words can't be doing what we would call understanding. It can't be doing the full un, you know, process of understanding. But it's worth noting that there are other stages of the human process of comprehension that might actually look a bit like a bag of words model and by extension might look a bit more like other models that we have as well beyond bag of words, as we'll see getting to in the third part. So the way that we detect the, the, brain re the response that we're going to be looking at is by electroencephalography, measuring electro electrical activity in the brain, and the component that we're going to be looking at is known as the N400 component. It's a negative deflection in the signal that peaks at 400 milliseconds after the presentation of each word during, during sentence comprehension. And it seems to be sen uh, sensitive to fit of a word to, to its context, how expected a word is in context. So if you have a sentence like, I take coffee with cream and, we have an expected continuation. If we get this expected continuation of sugar, you see a reduction in this amplitude suggesting facilitation because this was already expected. If we get something unexpected like soft, we do not see a reduction in that amplitude, the amplitude of that signal. So this is a way of sort of trying to measure the extent to which the brain at a given time expected a word to come, the extent to which a word was facilitated by the, the previous state of, of, of the processing. We have another measure that we can also use to gauge how expected a word is in context, which is more of a reflection at the endpoint of comprehension, and this is referred to as closed probability. Many people probably are familiar with this already. This is the closed probabilities are derived by humans filling, doing a fill in the blank task and untimed fill in the blank task. So we can assume that these humans can essentially draw on whatever information they have access to, give it some thought, and then make a prediction based on all available information. We're going to take this as sort of the best possible prediction using all of the information that might be useful to a human. So for I take coffee with cream and socks, probably going to have a closed probability of zero because people probably won't fill this blank in with socks. Sugar, maybe a close probability, I made these numbers up, but maybe a close probability of 0.60% of people might fill in socks. Now, these two signals often pattern together. The N400 often patterns with closed, but it in some cases deviates from closed. And these are points that are interesting, and it's going to come in again when I talk in, uh, in the third part about how we're testing pre-trained models. So in a case like this, for instance, Chow et al. found if you have a sentence like, the restaurant owner forgot which customer the waitress had, here an appropriate continuation is served. If you reverse the order of those two nouns, waitress and customer, now served is not an appropriate continuation. But what they found in this study was that the N400 showed a similar level of expectedness for served in both of these cases. Now, something that might quickly come to mind for us is, well, we can perfectly model that particular result by just thinking of this in terms of a bag of words, because the identities of the words that preceded served were the same in both cases. And the N400, as a response, likely reflects the most efficient available information for predicting upcoming words, for, for facilitating the processing of upcoming words. And it's possible that a bag of words type representation is a common go-to for this purpose, that, it, that at some point, the simple identities of the previous words are the most reliable predictor of aspects of the upcoming words. So we test this theory on another study from Federmine Kutish 1999. This had sentences like, he caught the pass and scored a touchdown. There was nothing he enjoyed more than a good game of. An appropriate continuation here is football. An inappropriate continuation here is baseball. And also inappropriate continuation here is monopoly. The difference is that baseball has the property of sharing the sports category with, with football. It's more semantically related to football. And what they found in this case was that even though baseball and monopoly both have a zero closed probability, Football and Monopoly, as you would expect, facilitation on football, no facilitation on Monopoly, but baseball had this intermediate level of facilitation that was unexpected, given that it had zero closed probability. And this was only the case in high constraint contexts, not the case in low constraint contexts. But Ryan Kuta said, okay, this is probably just because you're predicting football so strongly and it has overlapping features with baseball, so that's why you're getting intermediate <laughs> level of facilitation. You're sort of activating a little bit of features of baseball. What we said was, well, what, you know, what if we just model this with a bag of words account? Maybe we can get this pattern of result just by directly modeling the relationship between the context words and baseball itself. Maybe we don't need that intervening football role. 
So we just did the very simple simulation. We took keywords in the context, averaged together the word representations, the vector representations for those to get a, a, a context representation and took the cosine with the target. And sure enough, we were able to roughly replicate the pattern that was observed. So we see for the expected items, um, you know, a high level of facilitation for the between category items, less facilitation or no facilitation. And for the within category items, but just in the high constraint context, this intermediate level of facilitation. So what we take away from this is, okay, well, for the purpose of cognitive scientists, and this was really, the, this was the idea for this paper, um, this gives us an alternative explanation for this observed result, and the nice thing is it's made possible by the presence of word embeddings that allow us to quantify this relationship, this direct relationship between the context word and the target word. But for our purposes here, thinking about what's captured by, by our models, it seems like the bag of words model, while it may not amount to comprehension, it may align with other aspects of human processing uh, for predictable reasons, namely the fact that it captured co-occurrence statistics and, and it, these, these words representations are trained based on prediction of words in context, some variation on language modeling objective typically. And so the, the point that I like to make is that understanding which part, of, which of these sort of different levels of human processing we're actually ending up emulating hopefully can help us to improve in the desired directions toward actually emulating that endpoint of human comprehension rather than whatever it is that the N400 captured. So, we've been through the first two parts. We're now going to bring together these different parts. We're talking about the endpoint of comprehension, talking about trying to capture you know, the, the final types of information that humans are able to capture versus this N400 response, which is sort of a coarser predictive response that happens earlier in the processing stream. We're going to bring these things together to ask this question that I mentioned at the beginning of, okay, we have these language models that are doing incredibly well across so many tasks. How is it that that's happening? So again, we have this really impressive generalization of these models across large number of tasks. And what this seems to suggest is that there's some kind of generalizable linguistic competence or something that's being conferred on these models during the pre-training process that allows them to generalize so well. Something's happening during pre-training that's generalizable across tasks. And to sort of frame this roughly in the ter terms that I've been using uh, for the rest of the talk, the question we kind of want to answer, and this is a little bit of a fi false binary, but to what extent is this under something that we would qualify as understanding, and to what extent is it maybe something a little bit shallower that might resemble more of these sort of heuristically predictive responses? To ask this question, we're going to use as a case study just the BERT model, which probably most people are already familiar with. I guess I'm not totally sure it's the audience, but if anyone has, is confused, let me know. Um, something that is you know, important to note as we think about how we're going to deal with the BERT model is it produces not a single sentence encoding, and we talked about this as I was mentioning how Davis was probing BERT. Um, it produces a lot of different token representations. It has this DLS token that's, that's used for classification, and then all of the individual token representations, con now contextualized token representations that are used for um, word prediction and context or sequence labeling. So the question is, do we want to go with the same thing that we did before? Do we want to use probing tasks, these classification tasks, to try to probe for what information is being captured by this model? We could do that, but we have few a priori expectations with respect to exactly where we should find what information. This is a real challenge, this trying to probe within the internal workings of BERT, because you know, should we expect the DLS token to be the, the, the locus of the full sentence level information? Should we expect to be able to average together the token, the words, these token representations, at which layer should we expect the most of the information to be? So this, this makes using probing tasks a challenge. And probing tasks are also less direct than what we're gonna end up doing, which is just testing word predictions directly. This is what BERT is pre specifically pre-trained to do. So the alternative that we're gonna go with, is just go ahead and test in, in that natural setting of predicting words in context. And we're gonna formulate our test with the question of what information is BERT sensitive to when making word predictions in context. And the hope is that we can be as confident as possible that if BERT is failing to use information to make word predictions in context, it likely doesn't have, act if BERT is failing to use useful predictive information to make word predictions in context, it probably doesn't have access to that information because that's exactly what it was trained to be able to do. So we're going to be drawing as a resource on psycholinguistic tests for this purpose because they have two useful properties here. And I want to make clear that 
in using these tests, we are not testing whether BERT is psycholinguistically plausible. We're not testing whether it's using the same <coughs> mechanisms that are used by, within human cognition. We're just using these tests as a useful type of tool for testing information sensitivity. So the properties that they have that make this possible is that they are A, designed to draw conclusions based on predictive responses and context. So we can use them to do exactly what we just said we would like to be able to do, test BERT in its natural setting. And two, because these are designed by psycholinguists to ask very specific questions, that's, um, they allow us to ask targeted questions about these predict predictive mechanisms, about information sensitivity and about representational capacity. That's what they're designed to do with this tool as well. We're not gonna use just any old psycholinguistic test. We're specifically going to be focusing on tests that show, as I referenced before, an N400 closed divergence. So psycholinguistic experiments that have shown you have one thing that happens when humans have access to all the information when they're doing the closed task versus what the N400 does. These, and this is useful and informative because these are cases where the N400 predictive response shows some kind of apparent insensitivity to certain information that is useful for prediction and is used when people are doing a closed task. So the, the idea here is, a, this will probably represent a particularly challenging type of prediction task, but one that humans can definitely do when they're in the closed situation. And it gives us a built-in type of sensitivity <laughs> test to say, all right, there's a particular type of information that the N400 is showing insensitivity to. Let's see whether BERT is going to show similar insensitivity. This can be used for language models in general. We're going to be testing it on BERT. Question that I just read. So, we adapt three different psycholinguistic data sets, two of which I've already mentioned and one of which I'll show you in a moment. And within each of those three data sets, there are three tests that we apply. The first is a test of word prediction accuracy, saying how well can the model use the relevant information to guide word predictions and match the human predictions within the closed task. Sensitivity tests. Here we compare the probabilities that the model assigns to different words within that context say, how well can the model distinguish between completions that the N400 has shown insensitivity on? With the N400, you're always comparing two things to each other. And finally, we also do a qualitative analysis for each of the different data sets to say, all right, let's look directly at BERT's top predictions and see what they can tell us about the information that it's making use of in producing those predictions. So our data sets, we have three. The first is the C, what I call the CPRAG data set, which targets common sense and pragmatic inference. The second is the role data set targeting event knowledge and semantic roles. And the third is the, the NAG136 data set, which targets negation. That's the one that you haven't seen yet. We go through these in turn. The CPRAG data set comes from the Federer and Kutis football baseball study that you already saw. So we have sentences like, he's got the fast score of touchdown, nothing he enjoyed more than a good game of. He complained that after she kissed him, he couldn't get the red color off his face. He finally just asked her to stop wearing that. Now you can probably imagine as you're reading through these sentences, that in order to make accurate predictions, first of all, you need to use common sense inference to discern what's being described in the first sentence. It's never being referenced directly. There's some sort of situational description that's allowing humans to infer what it is that's being talked about. And then you need to use pragmatic inference along with all of the usual syntactic semantic processing to determine how the second sentence relates to the first. Let's go back to the examples and say why this is, and I like this example in particular for it. He complained that after she kissed him, he couldn't get the red color off his face. We as humans understand that kissing and red color being left on people's faces suggests lipstick. But this is not being mentioned. And there, there are some words like kiss and, and red that are somewhat associatively related with lipstick, but it's not strong enough as, as we'll see, or maybe I didn't give this example, but Bert fails on, definitely fails on this one. So you need to first infer that lipstick is being talked about, and you also need the pragmatic inference that the thing that he's gonna ask her to stop wearing is probably the thing that he's complaining about. There are other more probable things that you might ask someone to stop wearing. And this is, this is a pitfall that Bert definitely falls into. So for the sensitivity test, we then use the same thing that, that uh, Federer and Kutis used, which is, can Bert distinguish between completions that have semantic features in common? So that's just taking the same test. We have a good continuation of football, and then we have semantically related continuations of base mono baseball and monopoly. Can Bert reliably prefer football over either of the other two? For the role data set, again, this is the Chow et al. study that I've already showed you. Um, it has the role reversals. So for prediction accuracy, the, what the system needs to be able to do is use semantic role information and knowledge about typical events in order to make accurate predictions. 
so it needs to be able to tell, all right, well, in this case, probably the waitress is doing something to the customer. What is it that waitresses usually do to customers? These are, this is the type of knowledge and reasoning that needs to be employed in order to uh, make an accurate prediction in this case. Similarly, what do customers usually do to waitresses? For the sensitivity test, we're trying to say, well, we're asking, will BERT reliably prefer continuations in the appropriate context rather than the role reverse context? So will it reliably prefer serve for this context as opposed to this one where it's bad? That is, is it able to do a better job than the bag of words model? Not a better job of modeling the humans, but a better job of getting, modeling that endpoint of comprehension. Finally, the negation data set. And this is my favorite because it yields the clearest takeaways. This comes from originally from a study by Fischler et al. in 1983. We have sentences, a robin is a good continuation bird. If we add negation, a robin is not a bird is now not a good continuation. Something like tree, for instance, would be a true continuation in this case. But what Fischler et al. find is that the N400 shows a similar level of preference for bird in both of these cases over a continuation like tree. For prediction accuracy, it doesn't make a lot of sense to test BERT's prediction accuracy in the negated context because a robin is not A, has so many different possible reasonable continuations. It's just too high entropy of, of a context. But accurate predictions, it, so we only test the affirmative context. And in that case, within those affirmative contexts, the accurate predictions really are relying on the ability to access hypernym information, the things that robins are. For the sensitivity test, this is where the negation test comes in. And we're asking, can BERT prefer the true continuations to the false continuations with sensitivity to how negation affects which things are true and which things are false? So for the experiments, the way that we set this up, the way I set this up is we put a mask token in the target position to em emulate BERT's pre-training process. And then we just extract BERT's word predictions, the probabilities that BERT assigns to each word of the vocabulary or word piece of the vocabulary um, on that mask token just as in pre-training. We use BERT base and BERT large, probably familiar to most folks in the audience, 110 million, 340 million parameters respectively. Now we're gonna talk about what we found on all the different data sets. For the CPRAG accuracy test, again, this is a test for common sense and pragmatic inference. And again, for the accuracy test, we're essentially saying, is football the current, the, you know, the top close item in the top K prediction? What we find is sometimes, so when K equals one, we have reasonably low accuracy, about a quarter and a third respectively for bird base and bird large. When we expand to K equals five, we get about half of them. I actually thought this was impressively high considering how challenging this prediction task is. Um, BERT is matching the human predictions in quite a few of the cases. Obviously there is a lot of room for improvement even so, but it, it is higher than I expected it to be. Um, I did a couple of follow-up tests to see the extent to which BERT was able to actually just use sort of shallower cues rather than common sense and pragmatic reasoning, which are hard to pin down without all these biases that I've been referencing previously. So there are a couple of things I did. First, I shuffled the first sentence to get rid of the word order information that might be helpful for that and just leave the lexical information. I also truncated the second sentence so that only two words preceding the target position remain. So you can retain part of speech information, part, you know, you probably know what part of speech is supposed to be, a little bit of maybe semantic information, but you don't have access to the rest of the second sentence. We see that the accuracy definitely drops to a substantial extent. So BERT is absolutely making use of additional information um, beyond just lexical identity and, and maybe trigram context. But it's also worth noting that there is a, a non-trivial amount of, of items on which BERT actually still is getting the right answer. And when you look at these, it's often uh, cases like the football case, the football example that I've been giving you, BERT does very well and it has extremely high probability for football after seeing very strongly cueing words like touchdown and it's usually in cases with strong words like touchdown that, that it's able to do well even with these perturbations. And then with both, it, it drops even lower. So it's absolutely making use of, uh, you know, pretty sophisticated sets of information in the sentence beyond just lexical content and, and engram context, but for some of the sentences, it just is having an easier time with just those cues. The sensitivity test, again, here we're testing is the probability assigned to football greater than the probability for either baseball or monopoly. And we see that the results of the sensitivity tests are pretty good. On a solid majority of, of items, for both for base and for large, do prefer football over either of the other continuations. That being said, obviously there's a, a decent chunk of the items for which it actually is assigning a higher probability to one of the other two. 
And these differences are fairly small as a test of just generally how, how robust these differences are, are, how large these margins are. We imposed, I imposed a, a, a 0 0.01 threshold, just saying how many of these differences exceed a threshold of 0.01 in terms of the difference between the probabilities. And the sensitivity drops substantially when you impose that threshold. So these are pretty small. It doesn't seem like it's as strong a, of a sensitivity that, that the closed response reflects. But when we just impose a, a um, standard of being able to choose the good one over the two bad ones, it's pretty good at that. For qualitative analysis, this kind of bears out what we were saying about whether it's able to pick up on these kind of oblique descriptions. We have sentences where it made errors. Pablo wanted to cut the lumber he had bought to make himself. He asked his neighbor if he could borrow her car, house, room, truck, apartment, all reasonable things to borrow, but nothing having to do with cutting lumber. So it wasn't able to infer the connection there. Either it wasn't able to pragmatically infer the connection between the second and first sentences, or it didn't understand what you need to cut lumber. Snow had piled up on the drive so high that they couldn't get the car out when Albert woke up his father handed him A. Note, letter, gun, all things that someone might hand someone, but all pretty non sequitur with respect to the snow shoveling theme that was supposed to be going on. Yes. Remove the first sentence? I don't think that I specifically did the sensitivity test without the first sentence at all, just the shuffled one. Actually, no, I didn't even do the perturbations for the sensitivity, so I'm not sure off the top of my head what would happen. Um, yeah, good question. It is trained on sentence pairs, sentence pairs. Um, in addition to the language, the mass language modeling uh, pre-training task, the other part of its objective is a next sentence prediction task. So for any pair, it's doing a binary classification of whether those pairs, that pair was actually in sequence. So half, the time, half the time, it's a random sentence uh, inserted as, as the second sentence. So it's kind of like a guess, yeah, so a thing to note is that I treat these all, so my understanding is that the way that they pre-process the birth data, they just take 512 tokens. They're not really sentences, they're just strings of about 512 tokens. Um, so you're gonna have, send, you know, you're gonna be crossing sentence boundaries and a lot of sentence boundaries at that point. So all of these, I put a step token after both of these. I don't treat these as, as a pair of words, I just treat it as a, as a single string and you're making a prediction within those. So I'm not treating it as like a, a paraphrase task or any of these things where you have an A and a B designation for the two, I just treat this as, as the one. And because of the <coughs> fact that it's much shorter than, than the, the 512 token limit, um, I, I don't think that this is that far off from, from something that it, that it typically would do in terms of predicting words and context. Train it on sentence pairs other than the way it's already trained on sentence pairs? Yeah, and what I call the sentence pairs. Oh, uh, yeah, potentially. Um, again, I think that it's gonna be trained on a lot of sentence pairs because you're gonna have actual consecutive sentence pairs within that A segment because it's long. But, um, but yeah, I guess if you took out the next sentence prediction objective entirely and just always had everything be in sequence, then, then maybe it would be better at this. So I just, what you said, Zach, and I agree with. So there's, this could totally just be right because these are all under the minimum length. And the next sentence after it's impressive, which doesn't really have a second or next sentence after it. Like this is all just like it's completely a failure and you should have thought of a better one. <laughs> or maybe that's not where you're going. Oh, I mean, I, well, I wasn't going to go that strongly, but I'm glad you agree. I appreciate your support. Yeah. Um, yeah, so cool. Great. Yeah, so I, I, I think that I, I'm, I'm on that side of things. I think that it's pretty, I don't think it's that far outside of, of the, the, the settings that, that we're using. Um, at the zoom, I see straws. They painted the black and white stripes on the animal. I explained to her that they were natural systems of A. Again, it's picking up on an animal theme. Not that surprising, given the words zoo and animal, but it, uh, it, it hasn't picked up on the fact that it's a zebra. And exactly what this is a failure of, probably common sense, your knowledge about what zebras look like, how we would describe them. All right, so that's data set one. Let's fly through the other two data sets. So um, for role, the role accuracy test, again, what we're testing here is whether in the first case served is in the top K predictions, this is the top close example, whether tipped is in the top K predictions for the other one, where that's the best example. The accuracies in this case are quite a bit lower, but in fairness, the constraint level, the max close of these items are, is also lower. So we have to keep that in mind. And when we 
also look at the fins of constraint level, we do see that higher constraint fins do yield higher accuracy. But in general, we do see once we go to case five that Bert Lars is doing a better, a substantially better job of matching the semen predictions. We have a couple of perturbations. One is removed information from the object by just inserting a generic word like one or other, removing uh, all the information from the subject similarly. Something that's interesting with this perturbation is BERT base shows almost no change in the accuracy, the word prediction accuracy, but BERT large drops precipitously in the word prediction accuracy, which suggests in some sense that BERT large is actually making substantially more use of the interaction between both the, of those different nouns, whereas uh, BERT base maybe is not. Not totally sure what to make of that, but it's an interesting pattern. Um, and then both of them you know, go pretty low when we, when we take the information away from both. Also, some they, yeah. The one bit of information that it does have left is the information from that more distant subject because you had you know, the restaurant owner forgot which. Okay. Yeah, so there's a little bit of it. So it's basically just predicting the rest based on the restaurant owner forgot which one the other had. It usually says killed. It, it, that was by far the most frequent completion, was killed. I didn't end up including that in the paper, but it was, <laughs> it was true. Sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't test K systematically, so it, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that curve would look like. Um, for the sensitivity of the test, again, this is testing. All right, well, let's just compare these two different contexts and how often served is assigned a higher probability in the good context versus the bad context. In this case, again, sensitivity, pretty high, very strong majority of cases where it does prefer the, the completion in the good context versus the bad. But again, these are reasonably small margins when we impose a 0 0.01 threshold on the difference between probabilities, the, the numbers go a lot lower. Qualitative analysis, some interesting things to note. Camper reported which girl the bear had versus which bear the girl had. Bert Base has killed and bitten in both contexts, whereas Bert Large has managed to filter out sort of the attacking verbs for the cases where the girl is doing something to the bear. So this seems like a clear case where Bert Large is doing a better job than Bert Base, also reflected in the accuracies that we saw. But we also see that for the restaurant owner forgot which customer the waitress had versus the waitress the customer had, serves as the top completion for all of these cases. Um, it's worth noting that for both models, serves definitely has a lower probability for the good context than for that one, but it's also worth noting that it isn't able to identify something more appropriate as the top completion for the second case. All right, that rounds out the role one. Um, now on to the negation. So we again, the way we do the, the accuracy is just in the affirmative context. Um, is bird in the top K bird predictions for this a Robin is a context, etc. When K equals one, numbers not all of that great. When we look at the outputs, we this is exclusively because of the top completion being identical to the subject. So a Robin is a Robin, a Daisy is a Daisy. True not that useful. Um, but when, when we expand to K equals five, 100% retrieval of the, of the correct hypernym, suggesting a really robust ability to associate these words with their actual hypernym, which is, this was pretty impressive. When we go to the sensitivity test, again, we're testing here for a Robin is a, is it able to assign higher probability to bird than tree? For Robin is not a, is it able to assign a higher probability to tree than bird? This is based on what is a true completion. For affirmative context, it has 100% correct. And for negative context, 0%. It exclusively assigns the higher probability to the untrue completion in the negative context. It always prefers bird, a robin is not a bird, to a robin is not a tree. Similarly to the weight of the N400 pattern, quite similarly. So this suggests a real problem with respect to Bert's ability to handle generalizably the meaning of negation. Because if you want to be able to if you know the meaning of negation, then you know that when you insert a negation in there, the correct, the, the, the good completions are going to reverse. 
this is not the way that this is working. And we can talk about the fact that this is not surprising that this is the way that this model works. But from a perspective of that human capacity for understanding how words are supposed to work, it is definitely an issue. Looking at the outputs of the system, we, we see essentially what we would expect. A robin is a bird, robin, person. Uh, a robin is not, uh, the continuations basically don't change. They change a little bit, but they're essentially the same. So you end up with a lot of untrue completions. Um, another thing that I like to note here is something that is a very strong component of this output, which is this difference between a versus and. I have, I have a little time here. So, um, the difference here, if you see an A or an AND, you're able to infer whether the next word should start with a consonant versus a vowel. And sure enough, well, you know, holding constant everything else about the context, it gives pretty good completions, but exclusively using the correct. There was one exception, I think, uh, I think an ant is an uh, ant or something like that. It, it did that, but that was, I think, the only exception to being able to handle this. So it did quite well with handling the impacts of the determiner. So the basic takeaways, um, the model really does look to be decent on sensitivity to those role reversals and to those differences within semantic category from the football baseball things, but it does look like it's a bit of a weaker sensitivity than we see in the closed patterns, which are really big differences between uh, whether people choose these completions versus these other ones. The model looks like it's great with hypernyms, great with these determiners that I was just showing, and the completions are always grammatical basically always very grammatical, which is quite impressive. But with more challenging types of inferences, like those common sense and pragmatic inferences that we were seeing for the, um, for the federal rank data set, the CPRAG data set, and for event-based prediction that we're seeing in the role data set, we see that there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of being able to make use of the full set of information that humans are able to use to converge on a completion. And then finally, we see a really clear insensitivity to the contextual impacts of negation, which has, I think, very important implications discuss these now. Many of these results just give us sort of a general indication that these pre-grained models do have still a way to go to be able to incorporate things like human inference that are part of that process of, of language understanding. The negation result, though, is more striking and a bit starker in terms of how extreme it is. If we think about it, again, it's not that surprising, given the nature of language model-based training, that this would happen, because negation isn't really conducive to making clear predictions. So it's likely that these models wouldn't pay a lot of attention to negation because it's not going to be a very reliable cue for making word prediction in this context. Totally sensible. When you, once you give it a little bit of thought, it's not that surprising that this happened. But this, it's still important that our systems be able to handle and understand the meaning of negation if they're going to be doing quote unquote understandings. This doesn't seem very controversial. So you know, what this leads us to, to ask is, okay, well, what other aspects of comp comprehension may have this property? Because presumably it's not just negation where we're gonna be seeing this divergence between what language model-based pre-training is cut out for learning versus what we actually need to be able to know in order to comprehend the meanings of sentences. So I think that is the open question that, that this raises. Uh, you know, are we able, going to be able to do this with language model-based pre-training? Are we gonna need something else? And what else might we be missing that we just haven't hit upon yet. So that concludes uh, the three different sections. To summarize, the point I've been making is that we want to be able to capture the endpoint of comprehension. We want to be able to extract, extract, represent, and deploy all the types of information from language input that humans are able to. What we seem to be very good at right now, because this is what we're doing, is leveraging co-occurrence statistics in a way that maximizes our ability pr to predict surrounding upcoming words. This gives us a lot of, of um, distance in terms of the problems that we're trying to solve, but what it seems to resemble in some cases is uh, these earlier stages of human comprehension rather than that endpoint. We see these places where those two, two things end up diverging, and this is what we were testing in that third part. So my hope is that in trying to identify things like this, hopefully, in understanding what parts of human processing we are actually managing to emulate, whether it's accidentally emulating things that are more errorful or successfully emulating the things that actually have all of the sensitivities and information types that we want, hopefully this will help us to target the right things and end up meeting our goal of, of handling language understanding as we want to. I want to thank people who uh, were collaborators on these different projects and uh, funding sources that support all this work, and thank you to all of you for your attention. So
show the, the conclusions we have, uh, which are about the model of burden or not protected. How different would those conclusions be if you had tested uh, black or amber and white? How different? So if I had gotten the same result? Meaning, meaning like if you, so you were using all these, let's say the modern one was model. If we had gone back to one of these models from 10 years ago, um, what do you suspect would be the difference if you chose the pattern of how well it worked? Oh, I see. I'm, yeah. I'm guessing like all the results would be a little bit better, but like where the model failed or succeeded, would they be fundamentally different? That's a great question. If I'm understanding correctly, you're asking, you know, how would the patterns of results look different with more standard yeah. end-to-end models? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think we got a little bit of a sense of that from one of the perturbations on the CPRAG data set, since we, I did take just an NGRAM context, but it has access to that whole first sentence, so that is a difference. Um, but it already docks the performance to a substantial extent. I think that it would do very badly in general on, on the CPRAG data set. I think NGRAM models would not get far on that data set. The, the role data set, that's really an interesting question because we do find some patterns when we look, and I actually just been working on this now, when we look at just the n-gram context, to what extent are we able to replicate the pattern that was observed with that, and 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 sort of observe that plus other studies that have seen slightly different results with this role reversal? Um, I don't think it's perfectly able to replicate it, but that relationship between just the subject, which falls within the trigram context, versus uh, between that subject and the verb, actually is non-trivial in being able to account for some of those results. So that in that case, you might see some it, that gap might be not too far off. In the Robin is a, I guess, the key information would fall outside of the trigram. Um, if you start to drop the, drop the stop word, uh, that one might look pretty bad. Um, now, something that I didn't mention just for the sake of time is there's a follow-up part of the, da the negation data set which uses, quote unquote, more natural sentences. And you do see a better performance if we're on these, quote unquote, more natural sentences. I keep using scare quotes because I think that most likely the reason that we're doing better here is not because it's just more natural and it's able to use pragmatics better, which is the idea of the human study that used these materials. It's probably just that those particular sentences appear more often in Bert's training, and so it's able to make use of the negation in a really not a generalizing generalizing way, but a way that uh, just makes use of, of types of context that we've used before. So in terms of, of n-grams, yeah, I think that it would do especially badly on the first one. Um, again, I was quite surprised with how well Bert did, even even though it certainly didn't do perfectly. Um, with the other two, the engram models might make more headway, provided that you make sure that the, the one key contentful bit of information in the Eason um, item is, is there. After the target position. It seems like a thing that I may have tried at one point, but I don't remember whether I did. I my reasoning was essentially essentially what I was describing when when this came up in the discuss in the discussion, which is there isn't a qualitative difference that I want to impose in terms of those two sentences. They really should be you know qualitatively the same rather than being two things where we're trying to compute a relation between them that the CLS code then will be responsible for, which is how Bert handles. Uh, Relations between two sentences. So, so I it, it, it was a calculated decision treating them in that way. The the role of the step token. I, I had the only ways in which I made use of birth by directionality because I wanted a, you know maximally to be able to operate with with unidirectional left right line models as well. But just to be as fair as possible to bird, I did put a, a period and a step token. The period and the step token on the right just to maximize its chance of producing just a single word because it recognizes that it's the end of the sentence rather than the start of the phrase. But yeah, I didn't I didn't mess around too much with putting the step token in different places, so it could be an interesting thing to try. Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly how that dynamic looks. 
Um, because again, the comparison that we're making is just Robin versus tree and not looking at tree across the two concepts. I <coughs> what I do know is that the probability of a bird goes down, I believe, a bit. I don't know that I checked whether tree goes up. Not sure. But yeah, worth checking. Good question. Yeah, no, it's absolutely, it was very post hoc. It was a restatement of the empirical findings. It's just a speculation about. Um, yeah, I think that would be great. I think that's a good, a good goal moving forward to have hypotheses ahead of time about what's going to be possible with language models and what isn't. Um, I really didn't go into this thinking about what is in principle, what about language is going to be in principle learnable by language models. It wasn't until I started thinking about why, in retrospect, why the negation didn't do well. Again, very post hoc speculation um, that it seems like it's just, it's just not a crazy thing given the way that, that the models are optimized. But yeah, it really wasn't an a priori hypothesis and it would be nice to go in, you know, to come up with other, I mean, this would also be useful just for identifying what other things you need to test for. But I think it becomes an interesting question um, Something that I am very interested in is sort of what in principle we're able to learn by leveraging this word prediction signal uh, and how that is going to differ in the end from what it means to have learned to begin. So yeah, definitely post hoc, but, but I think it's the type of question that we need to ask moving forward. <laughs> yeah, um, certainly occurred to me. Um, Yes, they're very small data sets because they're designed by psycholinguists by hand. And so I, I think that would go a bit against the spirit of, the, the, you also can't, um, you can't, you can't train on them. They're exclusively chance sets. So what you could do is try to make sure that your data has statements like a robin is a bird and a robin is not a tree and see whether it's, you know, not those specific ones, but but something similar to that and just you know, make sure that you're training on something. Because again, like I said, with those more natural sentences, if, and again, I'm speculating, but if you've seen things with negation that have these types of completions, then the language model is going to be great at it. Our question is the extent to which the language model is able to use all of that, whatever knowledge it has obtained in a generalizable way in context where it has never seen this particular type of thing, but if it knew the meaning of the thing, then it would be able reliably to, to, to know how it's supposed to impact those, those continuations. So yeah, absolutely, you know, given that that's the culture, that is a concern of mine, but I think it kind of goes against the spirit of how this is supposed to work, because it wouldn't be that difficult to beat them by just putting very similar types of data into the, into the training set. Whether since representation is a single vector or not, um, I, I do not have a clear opinion. I, I think this is an open question. What will be most effective? Um, again, I think that what matters is defining what we need out of those representations, figuring out a way effectively to test that, and and, and then testing it. And if we find that you know, Mooney's right and, and you can't cram everything into a single vector and you need to have contextualized representations of everything or some other thing, that's fine with me. It's no skin off of my back. I just want us to be able to define the problem uh, and, and be able to evaluate it effectively. Thank you. 
Oh, for the first part. Yes. Uh -huh. The probes yeah. in the probing task in the in part one, yeah, um, yes. So this was a whole struggle in figuring out how to do this. The way that Adi et al. did it is they used um, the word embeddings, and I wanted to avoid this a to make sure that we weren't reliant on you know an assumption that the nature of that word embedding would be retained in an identifiable way in the sentence embedding, um, and b because we don't know you need to use the word. <coughs> for each individual system, and so that's variation that you can't control. So we ended up using one hot vectors and learning a mapping. So we have one hot representations of all of the probes. We make sure that all of the, each probe, not the combinations, but each individual probe is present in, in training such that a mapping is able to be learned for that, for that one hot representation. And it wasn't a perfect approach. It meant that we had to sort of restrict our probes to make sure that it was learnable. We had a fairly small vocabulary of probes, but it was the solution that we ended up having it come up with sort of the lesser of two evils. Better to